Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our ESRAS Roundtable session seminar. We have a very distinguished speaker today. It's Professor Jürgen Hahn from our neighbor, neighboring institution, Russian uh, Polytechnic Institute, which is about, I would say, three hours away by car, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Hahn is quite well known in the broader area of systems engineering, in particular, you know, applying system engineering methods and tools that control dynamic systems to a variety of problems, in particular related to biomedical engineering and healthcare. So he is currently a professor and a head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at RPI. He received his diploma degree from RWTH Aachen in Germany and received his PhD and MS degree from UT Austin, both in chemical engineering. He was a postdoc researcher back in Aachen, in Germany, after his PhD, and later on joined the faculty of Texas and M University before he moved to RPI, upstate New York, in 2012. His research interests include a broad area of systems biology, process modeling analysis, with over 114 peer review publications. He has received many distinguished awards, including the Fulbright Scholarship, the Best Review Award for General Process Control, Outstanding Contributed Paper Awards, Austin reviewers for the, you know, I would say, fresh journal of control community called Automatica for many, many times. He was a cast computing system technology, Austin young researcher, uh, and also elected fellow of AIMBE and elected fellow of AICHE. He also serves as the IGPOE Control System Society Board of Governor in 2016 and has been a cash trustee since 2014. Currently, he is the editor-in-chief for the Journal Process Control Journal. Apparently, it's the fresh journal in the process control community. And he's also an editor of the Journal Optimal Control Application Masters and associate editor for Journal Control Engineering Practice and Journal of Advanced Manufacturing and Processing. As you can see from the slides that's being shared right now, he's going to talk about something very interesting when data science meets metabolomics. Basically, it's a topic that related to towards the development of diagnostic tests for autism spectrum disorder. So please join me to welcome Dr. Han, and let's look forward to his presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, um, Professor Yu, and uh, also thank you very much for uh, the invitation, both to get to present, but also to uh, yeah, virtually visit Cornell, yeah? and. Um, so uh, one thing that I want to say at the beginning, you like uh, basically most people I talk to, they actually I have not heard like a scientific talk that dealt with autism in one form or another. So I'm going to give a bit more of an introduction because my work really lies at the interface yeah, of mainly machine learning and systems approaches, but then with applications to autism spectrum disorder. And that's really important in this context because this is a field where data science has not been used very lot, much in the past. And that's actually, there's, I would argue, tremendous potential for discovery and also impact because of this, okay? So if I look at autism spectrum disorder, and there's some numbers here, but also I wanted to say, what is this? And how does it that diagnose? And you can find the definition of autism really includes that it's an early uh, onset neurological condition. Yeah, that's characterized by two different things. One is difficulty in social communication interaction. And the second one is expression of restricted behaviors and interests. And clearly, if you use this as a definition, and by the way, this is what's used for diagnosis, you find that, well, I mean, how do I quantify this? Yeah, this doesn't tell me at all what's happening in the human body. Yeah, and so whenever people come up with saying, like, well, if you want to have some type of uh, treatments for certain now, conditions that go along with the autism, it's very hard to basically design a treatment if you don't really know what makes up the condition in the human body. Yeah, because all these definitions here, is, this is just an observation. And in fact, that's exactly how uh, an autism diagnosis is done. Yeah, if you have a child where there are concerns, you basically observe the child for extended periods of time and see how does the child interact with toys, with the parents, with other, with maybe the doctor, and then they determine um, is basically, is this diagnosis met or not? And of course, that's very, very difficult uh, to do. Yeah, and so what we wanted to do is saying, we want to dig deeper into this and say, maybe there's something characteristic in the human body that tells me about this. 
A few other things that are really important to know in this field is that one is that, yes, while this definition just talks about behavior, autism by itself rarely comes by itself, okay? There's a number of co-occurring conditions that are often happening. Some of them like intellectual disability or speech and language delays, you assume that, yeah, they're associated with the brain, but there's also other things like sleep disorder, or GI problems that you really would not associate with the brain. And in fact, one of the arguments that uh, I would make repeatedly is that this is actually a, a condition that affects the whole body. It's just that the definition of how we are diagnosed is mainly based upon behavior. And that's why there's a focus on the brain, but it's not restricted to the brain at all. Yeah. One thing that is also important, if you look at the, over the years, actually the number of people getting diagnosed with autism increases quite significantly. And the US comes up with a new survey every two years. And if you look over the last uh, 18, 20 years, basically the numbers are up 10, 15% over every, pretty much every period. Um, the last number I'm showing here was in 2020 where the number was one in 54, the 2022 numbers have been released and they're now up to one in 44. So that's actually over 2.2% of all eight year old children are diagnosed with autism. One thing that is really important to point out here is that, and for me as a scientist, I find this somewhat frustrating. If I look through the red general news media, then I'm often get this impression that's saying, well, I mean, we have more autism diagnosis, maybe we're just diagnosing better. And at the same time, there's also always the question of saying like, well, some people with autism do phenomenally well, so why is this even worth looking into? And the, the the idea you often get like is that in general, people with autism, they may be a little quirky, but everything else is always perfectly fine. And uh, unfortunately that actually does not match the ground truth, okay? Autism is a very heterogeneous condition and there are some people who are doing perfectly fine, have family and friends and jobs and sometimes higher degrees. But uh, the reality is that, um, for example, to just pick one number, the life expectancy in the US is roughly 80 years. If you have autism, your life expectancy is half that number, it's 40, okay? Um, roughly a third of the people diagnosed with autism are minimally verbal to nonverbal, yeah? And actually that number of the nonverbal has even been increasing over the years. So the diagnosis, we're not just diagnosing more people with very light conditions, it's actually quite the opposite. Um, over 80% of people with autism will never live independently. Yeah, they're going to need some care every day for the rest of their lives. So clearly, this is a condition that, yeah, there are some people who do really well, but the vast majority actually need significant help, in many cases, even around the clock care for the rest of their lives. So that is something to consider. And therefore, I would argue that anything to try to better understand what's going on would be very helpful. Here are some numbers now, and it said the last survey says one in 44 children and the US focuses on eight year olds has this. For some reason that we really don't understand well, it seems to be four times more prevalent in boys than girls and almost everybody. I mean, the number from the CDC is 95%. I've seen some other surveys that pretty much report 100 said that, well, if you have autism, you have other non-directly autism related diagnoses as well that you probably wouldn't have without the ASD diagnosis. So clearly there's a lot of co-occurring conditions that go along with this. If you wanna put this in terms of numbers, and this is from 2015, so it's a little dated, but I had a very good survey in 2015 that compares the cost of autism in the US to other conditions, yeah, like depression, ADHD, Alzheimer's, diabetes. And you find that actually the, the, and the cost for uh, autism is on the same order of magnitude. It's actually, a little bigger than most of these conditions then. And since then, the numbers have increased even further. And so um, this is it's a significant problem. This is not some fringe problem we're dealing with. I mean, there are some projections that talk about as the people that we already have with the autism diagnosis, even if the diagnostic numbers don't increase further as they age and need care for uh, the rest of their lives, that uh, a sig very significant chunk of the entire US budget yeah, uh, would have to be spent on this. So it's something that people may wanna give some thought to. Yeah? And as I said, the key here is that um, right now, everybody agrees that if you have an earlier diagnosis, you can start some earlier treatments. And at the moment, these treatments are mainly 
um, basically special education behavioral because we don't understand so well what's happening in the human body. But there's a general understanding that the earlier you start treatments, the better the outcome throughout the lifetime. Yeah. Ideally, if you have people who are really on top of everything, you should be able to diagnose people at 18 to 24 months. But uh, the average diagnosis in the US is closer to four years. Yeah. Um, also, the part of the problem you're dealing with is if you're looking at an 18 year old, uh, 18 months old, and trying to figure out are they behaving normally or do they have some delays, but they may or may not be autism related, it's really, really hard to say. Yeah, it's not always so clear cut. And so oftentimes people get a diagnosis saying like, well, let's, let's see where things develop from here. And then a year or so later, people can not ignore this anymore and say, okay, clearly this is an autism diagnosis. If I look at numbers in other countries, they aren't doing any better. Like in the UK, the average age is over five years old. Yeah, and uh, pretty much every country you have, it's like four years plus. So just putting more resources in this is not gonna help. Yeah, um, but one of the big, big problems is that as of now, there's no lab test that tells you if somebody has autism or not, or even indicates this. Yeah, and um, so without the test, and if you're just based on observation, this is gonna be a bit problematic. And that's kind of where our work set in. That was the motivation. If I look back a little bit at the history of ASD and where people think this comes from, this is, um, there's generally like, like, 20 years ago, everybody thought it's all genetic, it runs in the families, and there's no argument that uh, if there's ASD uh, cases in the families before, that that increases the risk. But our understanding has shifted quite dramatically. Now we're talking more about that maybe half of what we're seeing may be due to family and genetic uh, inherited issues, but the other half may be environmental. Yeah, and with environmental, I am not just talking about the environmental pollution. I'm talking about things like what was the, now what happened to, during pregnancy because in the womb, like if there is a maternal infection that is also called the environmental factor and so on. In order to basically focus on this, we say, okay, fine. There's, I mean, clearly this is a very poorly understood field, but there's many different hypotheses that people have. So let's pick two hypotheses and then we really want to look at the pathways level. I mean, given my background really is in computational systems biology, I like looking at pathways and analyzing what we're seeing there. So we said, fine, if we assume that half of this is inherited and on the genetic side, like we know that things run in family, but when people actually try to identify which genes there are, as of now, after 20 years of looking, we still have not found a single gene that actually encodes for autism, okay? That means that the genes that make it more likely somebody has an autism diagnosis are also more likely with many other conditions, yeah? So that's not, hasn't really gotten us there, but there is a bit of a focus on saying, maybe we need to look more at epigenetics. So I'm gonna pick that too in order to cover this inherited side. On the environmental side, oftentimes, we do know that there's oxidative stress that's involved. Yeah, that's basically the body's response um, yeah, to environmental stresses often that we're dealing with, basically, now we're trying to change op the oxidative state. Yeah, and so we said, fine, let's look at pathways, one for oxidative stress and one for covering the epigenetics. So in particular, here we're focusing on two pathways. One is the folate dependent, one carbon metabolism. And if you can see my mouse pointer here, so I'm gonna basically go around, this whole part from here to here, this is our folate one, um, no, folate dependent one carbon metabolism. And um, what's important here is that leads to where SAM gets converted to SAW, and that actually methylates DNA, and that's the driver of epigenetics. Okay, so basically, this pathway plays a key role in epigenetics and the regulation underlying epigenetics. So, we're going to look at this pathway as such. Then this pathway intersects here with the transsulfuration pathway, and the transsulfuration ultimately produces glutathione. And glutathione is the body's most powerful antioxidant. So if there's oxidative stress, you're gonna see some changes uh, or abnormal concentrations in glutathione as a result of that, yeah? And so basically this is what ties this part to the epigenetics and this part to the oxidative stress by looking at these two pathways, which by the way are interconnected. Yeah. One thing that's really important, and this is basically where the data science aspect comes into it. When we're dealing with metabolic pathways, people often they have taken, they have studied these, they have taken measurements and they look at, 
are basically uh, the concentration of individual compounds within a desired range. Yeah, and you find that in general, children with the ASD diagnosis, the, uh, that the, they are statistically different somehow from the typically developing peers. But if you look at individual measurements, you can never determine that somebody will either has an ASD diagnosis or not, because the range of changes that you even find in the typically developing group is dramatic. Okay, and the reason for this is that well, I mean, many of these metabolic pathways, they're interconnected and they're also related to lifestyle factors like diet. If you have a certain diet, some things are gonna be more up or down regulated based upon this. But what I basically, what we brought to the table, which I'm gonna to get to more into in a minute, is that saying like, well, rather than looking, for example, at the concentration of folate or methionine, if there's something not right in the pathway, then it may actually be that for example, here, the, when SAM is converted to SAW, that there's something wrong here, regardless of if SAM is higher, then SAW is also going to be high. But it may be that the ratio is of interest. So we're looking at multivariable aspects, yeah, which is not a completely foreign concept in healthcare. I mean, when on a different topic, when you get your cholesterol checked, we are looking at ratios of good to bad cholesterol now. We're not just looking at individuals. But for some reason, in this field, Traditionally, people had not done this. They had looked at individual measurements only. So we said, no, there's more to this. Let's see if basically we can distinguish two groups based upon um, multivariable analysis here. And so basically for uh, I'm, the initial part here, I'm gonna make use of a clinical trial data where we recruited roughly 160 participants. Yeah, and uh, these are all young children and uh, 83 have an autism diagnosis, 76 are typically developing. And then here, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but we took siblings of the children with autism, but they are typically developing. So they actually belong to this group, but genetically they're much closer to this because they're the siblings. And we took a panel here of 24 different measurements that we had. And we knew of course here, um, if they had the autism diagnosis or not. Secondly, I wanted to not just talk about, well, can you determine if somebody has a diagnosis or not, but can I be able to predict certain behaviors? Yeah, and um, people often, when they want to talk about autism severity, there is no one autism severity score, so we can't do that. But there's a number of different behaviors that are related with autism, like adaptive behavior. We do know that children with autism, if they're more severely affected, they struggle more to adapt to new situations. And so basically that's reflected in the Vineland and saying, well, do our metabolite concentrations somehow relate to what we're seeing here? And um, I'll briefly go through this given that uh, a lot of people have a systems background, but clearly this is made up data if I'm using FDA to make the case for multivariable measurements. So if I had a group of blue and a group of red, the, the, the dots would correspond to a different group where let's say one had an autism diagnosis and one didn't. If I just look at the variable X1, I cannot distinguish blue from red. They're just overlapping everywhere. In fact, I would argue even the mean is somewhat similar. If I looked at the, 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 just the variable X2 that I'm measuring, I would find that, yeah, red on average is, has a higher value than blue, but there's a significant overlap between red and blue as well. I still couldn't determine what to do. But if I look at both these measurements together, then clearly I can project them on a line. I basically put an intercept here and saying everything negative is red and everything positive is blue. Yeah, so clearly I can do some classification here. Now we can go to more dimensions than just two. It's just that I can't uh, illustrate this uh, as easily on the computer screen. Yeah, but that's ultimately what we're doing. If there's nonlinearities involved, or there's a, there are nonlinear extensions like uh, with the kernel, where essentially here, if I have data that this one cluster is relatively close to something and something clusters much further outside, I can using the kernel trick also basically project these and then determine if you're basically blue or red. So I, there is a natural nonlinear extension to this. One thing that is really important for all of this, yeah, is that when we're dealing with parameters, we don't want to overfit. That is a real big problem in these types of trials. So I have my data from my real system. That is ultimately my patient data, yeah? And then I want to estimate my model where the model tells me, do you have autism diagnosis or not? But ultimately, then I want to hope that what I find from my model will describe my real system well. Well, but this is not directly doable, even though that's the goal here. Instead, 
the way this always has to go over data. So I'm collecting data from my system and I know that there is a certain error that is inherent in this. And then my model wants to works on the data. And the hope is if the model, the error between model and data is small and between data and the real system is small, then hopefully my error between the real system and the model will also be small. Yeah, but we have to be really careful here about not overfitting. Uh, so let me give you one simple example here. And again, this is made up to illustrate a point. If I had a curve here, like the one shown in blue, yeah, and so in this case, I know there's a fourth order polynomial and you see here the curve. And now I'm gonna basically get some data point, these pink dots here, which are essentially near my blue curve, but with a little bit of noise added. So you can see that, well, the measurements are actually aren't too bad. But now I'm gonna estimate a curve and I'm even cheating. So I even know here, which in reality, I will never know. Okay, but I'm estimating what is, am I picking the same model structure? And so if theta naught is one and theta one is one and theta two is one and so on, this should give me a perfect fit for what I'm doing. But I can only estimate this using the data that I have. And you find here my black curve goes perfectly through all the dots, but clearly the black curve does not represent the blue curve really well. So I have actually introduced quite a bit of error between the data and um, my real system and my model because I'm overfitting. Now, this is an extreme example. I had five data points and estimating five parameters, but the reality is you need a lot more data than you have parameters or this is gonna run into a problem. Yeah. On the other hand, if I pick the simpler model, like the one shown in red here, yeah, which is just three parameters. And yeah, I know there's model mismatch between my model and the plant, but then you can find that actually here, my red curve, looks a lot closer to the blue, even though it doesn't go through any of the dots that we have there. And so clearly overfitting is something we have to be very concerned with because these types of clinical trials we're dealing with here, yeah, they are basically, um, you're, you're always gonna be limited in the number of people participating in the trial. And so this is something that we always have to consider. So one way to deal with this is that we can use leaf on out cross validation. So rather than taking our samples and computing our errors between our predicted model and the actual measurements, we're leaving a sample out, we build the model based upon the rest, and then we're predicting the sample that we've left out. We put the sample back in, we take another sample out, and again, the error that we're computing is only computed for the one that was left out. And we do this until at some point we've left everything out once, and this is our errors, and that's what we want to minimize, yeah? And so if we apply this to our data set here, then you're going to find actually something really uh, fantastic that uh, here in red, those are the participants um, that are typically developing. And in blue, those are the ones that basically have an autism diagnosis. If I'm using seven of my variables, I don't even need the entire measurement panel. Then you find they nicely separate the ones with a, di with a diagnosis here in blue from the ones without. So if I look at the probability density function, yeah, there's some overlap. It's not gonna be 100% accurate but uh, you're gonna end up with very, very high sensitivity and specificity here, yeah? And if you want to tune this, all you have to do is basically this dotted line, you can move this up or down, yeah? Um, so that if you like have fewer false positive or false negatives, depending on what you're more interested in. So clearly you can nicely separate this. As a side note, the current gold standard for um, diagnosing somebody with autism at two years of age, is the ADOS, yeah? And that's basically questionnaires that people fill out after an observation. And that's about 80% accurate. What you're seeing here on the other hand is basically we're talking about 97 and 96% uh, in, with regard to uh, sensitivity and specificity, yeah? So overall, this is very highly accurate for based upon the data that we're seeing here and basically very nicely describes our data. So out of the 83, for example, participants with the ASD diagnosis, we correctly identified 81 and only two of them, we missed the diagnosis. Out of the 76 with no diagnosis, we currently correctly said 73 had no diagnosis and we incorrectly gave a diagnosis to three of them. One thing to note is that some people are very worried. They don't like false positives. So I said, this has to be zero. Well, if you want that to be zero, all you have to do is you just shift this line around. Then you're going to have, so if this is zero, then I don't have any false positives. Um, yeah, then, um, no, but I'm going to have more people that, uh, no, I'm going to have my uh, accuracy of predicting who has autism will go down. That's fine, but it will still be about 90% in this example. So 
in short, is that um, using this metabolomic data and then using relatively simple machine learning tools like Fisher discriminant analysis, you can actually predict well, with over 96% accuracy if somebody has an autism diagnosis or not. And that is far above any number that both the current standard that people use or any other methods people have introduced. Yeah. And the other thing is what's interesting is that our, our idea was we wanted to look at oxidative stress and DNA methylation. Well, it turns out our two markers that we are using in our multivariable classification, one of them is a marker for oxidative stress and the other one for DNA methylation. So clearly what we assume to be important also comes out here. With the caveat, we are somewhat biasing the results because we're looking at pathways that are focusing on this anyway. But even within the pathway, really the key components came out here indicating this. So I think we're on the right track. Yeah. Um, the second step then what I wanted to look at is say, heck, okay, well, this is if somebody has an autism diagnosis or not, but can I say anything about behaviors, like how bad or how good behaviors are? Now, in this case, we're looking at these adaptive behaviors. And in order to that, that's clearly now a regression problem. That's not a classification problem. I mean, you have your standard ordinary release squares, which is not suitable here because simply we don't have enough data. You can use principal component regression, which removes some of the unimportant correlations in X. Yeah, we can use partial least squares, which is better because it removes unimportant correlations in X and Y as well as in X and in Y as well as between X and Y. And, uh, or you can use a nonlinear version of this like kernel partial least squares. And that's kind of what we have to do here and use Gaussian kernels. And if you apply this, you find out that basically with uh, the optimal one we get with uh, five variables as input. So similar for our classification, then we actually get an R squared value of 0 0.45. And to put this into context, I mean, this is healthcare data. So R squared of 0.45 is really, really good. This isn't like chemical plant data where I usually want to have 0.99 or 0.98. Yeah, most man-made um, or data collected from man-made things are very, very high, but there are plenty of healthcare decisions that even nowadays doctors make based upon R squared of 0.1 or 0.2. Okay, so 0.45 is actually a really, really good number. Yeah, so it doesn't exactly uh, replace that you could um, now collect the data from a vinyl for somebody, but it could be used to back up, especially since this is, I mean, you're, you're talking about once you have one blood sample, you may just as well take all the measurements you need and use it to back up your diagnosis. Okay, so in summary of this part of the talk, as of today, you don't have a reliable biomarker. For ASD, it's all based upon uh, observations. But what we've shown here for this data that the metabolite concentration of two particular pathways can actually be used to predict if somebody has ASD or is typically done with a high degree of accuracy. Yeah. Similarly, certain measures of ASD-related symptoms, their severity can be predicted. So there's significant potential here. Yeah. And but obviously, this needs to be validated as well. So when we publish this, given that. Literally, there had been nothing in this field prior to our work, and certainly uh, at the high accuracy, we got we got a lot of press. I mean, we made the journal cover. We had a high metric score. Um, this was in all the major U.S. news outlets from Thomson Reuters, yeah, um, CBS, NBC, ABC, you name it. Uh, it was on Medscape, um, Healthline. I mean, all of this you can still find. It's just a simple Google search, yeah. And uh, all of it looked very promising. So is that this was one data set and one study. And, uh, but like with any clinical data, you have to validate this. And the first quadrature problem you run into, really running an entire new clinical study is very expensive. And so we figured, oh, is there something cheaper that we could do? Now, and it turns out, well, there is no study exactly like this. Yeah, but we had a number of studies where people basically wanted to treat children with ASD, but they did some baseline data prior to any treatment, yeah? The only drawback is that we are only talking about children with the ASD diagnosis. So I have no typically developing peers here, but I had 154, so very good number, yeah? I mean, keep in mind, most phase two clinical trials, you're usually looking around 80 people, yeah? Um, so this is already quite a bit bigger than most phase two trials. So this is a very good number, yeah? Um, also, while, you, while these panels for the measurements used most of the metabolites we previously used, unfortunately, 
uh, our DNA methylation and also this 8 OHG measurement was not available anywhere. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, both of those were actually among the seven top two, seven top metabolites that we're using. So in order to use this data set, we said, fine, if you were to go back to the original data set, and we just pretend that we didn't have these, we just threw them out. We train a classifier on that, and then we just apply the stratifier to the new data. And knowing that having two of our top metabolites thrown out won't be a work as well, yeah? And um, what we found is that we still get actually very good class and very accuracy here. So original, the original data set, but now, having thrown out those two measurements, you have here the group, uh, the PDF for the group uh, with ASD in blue, and red, those are typically developing, and now I have this validation cohort, which by the way, the data was collected years later. And um, so there are some differences to be expected, but nevertheless, the black still very nicely separates from the red. In fact, if we used our ASD uh, or prediction who has ASD, we found that 88% of our um, predictions were correct. And as I said, given that the gold standard right now is 80%, people are happy with that. So anything that's significantly about 80%, we can live with. It doesn't have to be as fantastic as 95% plus, so also we certainly would like that. But, so this looks very, very promising. Yeah. Um, one result is that, um, I mean, doing some research in this field is one thing, but uh, given that there's no test on the market, it's really nice if actually there are some commercialization efforts going on. It turns out, a few months after our paper, I actually got a phone call from somebody who said, look, I uh, quit my job. I started a company and I want to license your IP and we're going to, our only product for now is going to be having this ASD test on the market. And this company now is Marosa, if you want to look them up. And so a lot of the things I'm saying here, you find on the website because their focus is really on getting this uh, to market. By the way, they use RIP, but I'm not involved. I'm not like a shareholder in Marosa or anything. And, um, but it's nice that their goal is to get this to market. And uh, as part of that, and that's where it goes beyond research and at the university is that you need FDA approval. And so you have to run clinical trials a certain way. And so they raised several million dollars to run a trial, which is now ongoing. You can look this up on clinicaltrials.gov. And I said that trial just started uh, now, relatively recently. And the goal is by the end of this year, to have all the data and then we're going to analyze the data and see if our uh, everything that we do holds up in a multi-center uh, uh, trial that's which is going on here and if that if it does then actually you have enough information for the fda to approve this and get the first test for autism on the market so that's one of the things that came out of our work all right um so let's uh, shift gears a bit. I mean, the, the, the other parts, two parts of my talk are still focused on autism, but different aspects. So what we've done so far, we focused on the metabolites. Yeah? And if you're interested in classification or predictions, that's all fine. But if you're ever interested in what about treatments, treatments usually do not change the metabolites directly. Yeah? In fact, what they do is when one metabolite gets converted to another, they change this conversion. Yeah, and so there are cofactors involved in these reactions. And so we want to say which of the reactions in our pathways are actually different here and what are they tied to and how could we then essentially design a drug molecule to affect certain reactions because that's the we're promising well. And so we are looking now at the reactions here rather than the concentrations. So in order to do this, we've had to build a model. And now this model is relatively simple because it's a steady state model. Yeah, and we are looking at, so this is still all the same two pathways that we had, but we have to simplify them in order to be able to estimate these parameters that we're dealing with here. And we have to make a number of assumptions, but based upon this model, which includes many of the key components we're interested in, yeah, we developed this and we said, okay, let's have a look at these parameters. How do they change from one person to another to figure out what is a normal probability density function of these parameters for somebody who has autism versus somebody who doesn't. Yeah, because it tells you where would an intervention be successful potentially and where it doesn't matter. And so basically we formulate this as a, an optimization problem. And as I said, there's a few, some of this you can actually get data from literature, but may, most of this we have to estimate from our own sources. Yeah. And um, we had to make some assumptions here because we had a reversible reactions. You don't always have the data to get all parts of the reversible. So you guys look at the ratio of one to the other. 
But if you made all of the right assumptions here, and then we look at how are these probability density functions of my two groups, then you find that, yeah, there's like some parameters like here in P3 or P6 or even P7, there is not much of a difference, okay? There's no point trying to come up with any treatments that affect these parameters because clearly there's not a big difference between the groups. But some other ones like P1 or P2 or also here with the P8 to P9 ratio among others, there are significant differences. And the question then comes like, well, if I were to take like, to this PDF of the people with ASD, if I were to come up with some way to manipulate this, could I convert this back to what I'm seeing here, the typical developing group? And if I do so, also then of course, with the behaviors also improve. Yeah? What is interesting, if I'm looking at these parameters where there are differences, yeah, you find that, yeah, some of them, the differences are minor, but some are significant as well. And what is interesting, if I'm looking exactly at the factors involved, then you can tie all of the factors that I'm seeing here, either to oxidative stress or to DNA methylation again, which is another indicator that's saying like, well, looking at those two pathways is important because that's exactly what's coming out here, even when I look at reactions. But now we have some potential targets that we may be able to influence. Yeah. And of course, this is a long way around, but no, but given, I mean, as of now, you don't have a single drug that's approved just for autism. Yeah. And so if you basically ever want to get to this point, you have to have at least know some targets and can figure out how do we go about this. All right. So in summary here, we looked at the model of the no, folate one carbon metabolism and the transfiltration pathways, but now with the goal to figure out which are the reaction parameters that you want to find out. And you find four of these parameters show significant differences between the two groups. Yeah, and that one is tied to oxidative stress, another one is tied to DNA methylation, and the other two are affected by oxidative stress. So clearly those are all things that uh, we found to be important here. And these are the ones that if you are developing a drug, I would try to target these and see what you're getting. The last part of my talk is you say, okay, well, we've shown that for young children, I see a difference in these uh, metabolites. But the question is, how young can you go? Because in most of my studies, the youngest I ever have is a year and a half. Yeah. Could you, for example, find in a 12 months old or six months old, do you find differences in the metabolite levels in their pathways already, or this is happening later? In a more extreme case, could you find differences already in the mothers during pregnancy? And that's what we were interested in. And so instead here, let's look at pregnancy. And as a, to put this into context, by the way, this is a terrible trial to conduct. Yeah, it's great data once you have it. But if you're looking at, you have to take blood samples from the mothers during pregnancy, preferably during the first, second, and third trimester. Then you have to wait the entire pregnancy. Then you have to follow them for several years. In this case, we stayed, said three years. Yeah. So I have a, almost a four year window where I have to follow the mothers to get one data point. And then you have to do this for everybody. And uh, so this trial that started in 20, uh, 2006, and I believe our paper came out in 2018. Yeah, so this is really, uh, really, really long term work. And that makes it very, that shows why it's hard to get information here because you have to follow people long periods of time, yeah? So the second challenge is that you say, yeah, ASD prevalence is roughly 2.3%, yeah? And uh, that means, um, by the way, sorry, I should have updated this number. This is roughly four children, yeah, four to five, not three, yeah? Um, but if you have 200 participants, you guys are gonna have a handful of children that have ASD. So that's not statistically meaningful. Yeah, so you either then have to include a lot more people in the trial, let's say a thousand or so, which makes the trial really, really expensive and harder to conduct, or you have to look at people who are more likely to have children with ASD. So if you have one child with ASD, the probability of having another one is almost 19%, okay? So out of that group means that if I include 100 mothers that had one child with ASD, the probability that another one has ASD I would end up with 18 to 19 on average children with the diagnosis out of it. So clearly I can recruit a little over hundred people and then I can actually do some statistical analysis. Whereas if I to recruit them for just the general population, you would need a large number of people to do this. Yeah. And so what we had here is that we had data from 129 mothers. Yeah, and 107 of those had 
a child with ASD and another 22 did not. And I'm, for now, I'm gonna ignore those 22 because I'm only interested in the ones that already had one child with ASD. And I wanna see, can I predict if the next one will have ASD or not based upon the metabolites of the mothers during pregnancy. We measured 20 metabolites here. We followed up three years later. And if you basically look at the numbers and we did this both by trimester, yeah, and you say like first trimester, we had a harder time recruiting people because they don't necessarily know they're pregnant. And even if they are, participating in a clinical trial isn't necessarily the first priority for them. But then in the second and third trimester, we had over 100 people. And then we have the control data. Those are the ones that have never had a child with ASD. And you find that, yeah, here it's a much smaller number, but uh, we're going to make use of this in a minute. Right now, I'm just looking at, can I predict this group from this group? That's what we're interested in. And if you look at your, your univariate analysis, you find there's almost no difference. I mean, there's a couple of variables only in the third trimester, but overall, this all looks the same. If you use our multivariable techniques, it doesn't get much better. I mean, we're talking about here uh, type one and type two errors that are 30, 40%. Yeah? And keep in mind, 50% error is like, I can, it's random chance. I can flip a coin. Yeah? So this is not useful. And uh, so even if I will develop this for individual trimesters, none of this came out to be good. So long story short is that if I take blood samples during pregnancy, I cannot predict if a child will have ASD or not. Yeah. Um, quite frankly, from a purely, um, no, but a, from a moral perspective, I am not unhappy that it came out this way because there's a bunch of ethical questions that could come into place if you could predict this. Yeah. Um, but you can argue, well, why are you showing us this then if it doesn't work? And it's like, well, there's a next step. He said, if I cannot predict if somebody has autism or not, but can I predict if you're in the high risk group of having autism, meaning you have an 18.7% chance that your child has ASD versus the control group? which is 2.3%, an order of magnitude less with us. And so here now we are comparing the data from these mothers that had children with ASD to the ones that hadn't, yeah? And uh, we wanna see, can I see differences between these two groups? Well, it turns out here, even with univariate analysis, you can see already there are quite a bit of differences. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can classify, but this is a lot, lot more promising than when we saw in the previous step. If I then go a step further and I said, I develop my models here and I use them. Um, here I use one model for all three trimesters. And then I have one, depending upon the trimester specific, then you can see that actually with arrows of roughly, I can get sensitivities and specificities that are roughly 90% or even better. Yeah, so that's actually gets me uh, quite a big way there. And in order to say, like, well, no, there is something in the data and I can predict. Now, I cannot predict if the child will have autism, but I can predict if you're at a high risk of having a child with autism or not, and high being 18.7, okay? So there's roughly a four and five chance a child will not have autism. But this still can be helpful because that can give people an idea if you're at a higher risk, there are certain risk factors you can mitigate. And so people now should be aware of what their risks are. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to make decisions on it, but I, this would actually be um, important information. All right. So as I said, to summarize this, we cannot predict if a child will be diagnosed with ASD during pregnancy. Yeah. Um, no matter what we method we use, this didn't get us there. But we can predict if you had a high or low risk of having a child with ASD. And I think that's still a really, really important result. And so let me summarize, coming to the end here and summarize overall what, we've done, what uh, I've presented here. Yeah, and you find that um, metabolites of the folate carbon, uh, one carbon metabolism and the transoverdation pathways show a strong correlation with ASD in a number of ways. Yeah, that can be used to support an autism diagnosis in children. They are also reasonably predictive of the adaptive behavior, which essentially is one of the behaviors for severity. Yeah? If I'm looking at the same metabolites, but now for mothers during the pregnancy, you will collect it. I can not determine if the child will end up with the ASD diagnosis or not a few years later, but I can tell you if they're at the high risk or regular risk group for having a child with ASD, which is important. And one of the key aspects is here, really all of our work on the system side of things. 
some of these trials, the data already existed. People had run univariate analysis on them and came to the conclusion that with univariate analysis, you find some differences here and there, but you cannot predict anything. But using machine learning approaches here, and I mean, for the systems people in the audience, uh, I mean, um, Fisher discriminant analysis is really not a complicated technique. But you find these multivariate approaches, they actually told you that there are some unique patterns related to ASD in some of these metabolites that are highly predictive and that we can make use of this. And so it turns out really that it's the system approach that turned these, uh, the trial data from these clinical trials into a very useful tool up to the point that um, a, di no, a diagnostic could actually be developed. Obviously it depends upon all of this holding up in uh, no, validation clinical trials, some of which are in the way right now. All right, so there's a number of uh, people I need to acknowledge here. Uh, one is uh, Daniel Hausmoon, who has done a lot of work on the ASD diagnosis, as well as um, now Troy Vargason shown here in, the, in my group picture. By the way, Daniel has graduated. He's now at the University of Texas as a, as a postdoc. Also the, um, no, the work on all the mothers, yeah, uh, that's uh, Katie uh, Hollowood jones She worked, uh, did all the work on there. I have a number of collaborators I need to thank because um, all of this data that I've shown you comes from clinical trials and things that were analyzed there. I do not run clinical trials myself, but so my collaborators at other institutions were responsible for that. And without them, we couldn't be doing any of this work. And of course, there are a number of funding agencies for our work that I would like to thank them. And last but not least, um, I want to leave you with this slide. And when it comes to autism, people always think about the brain because of behavior. But I would uh, tell people, well, you maybe need to think beyond the brain because all of our work looks at blood metabolites, which are somewhat correlated to what's in the brain. But I mean, this is a fun that the blood is, can be taken anywhere in the body. And uh, in fact, you find that there are uh, effects of autism that you see in many, many different organ systems in the body. So I've always close with this slide and saying, maybe you need to think beyond what we've traditionally done and move away from just diagnosing by behaviors and looking more at the body as a whole. So, and I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm more than happy to ask, answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Professor Han. This is very beautiful work and a very nice presentation. Um, so we do have some time for Q and A's. Uh, I see there is a question in the chat I don't know if the student or, or the scholar is still here. Would I to, I think Jeha Kim, I don't know if Jeha, you want to um, you yourself and ask, or do you want me to read it out? Um, so my question was like, um, cause engineering um, predictive, like uh, performance threshold, threshold is different from medical area. And I was wondering what is like minimum sample size or threshold for the medical area? Okay. Um, Yes, there, I mean, there are some numbers that people throw around, okay? So basically, uh, like if I want to classify between two groups, if I don't have at least 20 people per group, it's not helpful, all right? Then uh, basically, uh, that's, that you're going to have a very hard time publishing that because people say your sample size, your studies are underpowered, okay? And you also see this, by the way, for clinical trials, you usually have there are phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. Yeah, phase one just shows is something um, safe. Yeah, and then people kind of talk about put performance in there as well, but the goal is really safety. And uh, so clinic phase one clinical trials are usually as a minimum 40 because you have two groups, but more likely most of the time you have like 50 or 60 people participating. So if you're a little bit about 20. Phase two clinical trials, and it comes to performance saying, well, is something effective? Yeah, because if it's safe, but it doesn't do anything, well, it doesn't help anybody, yeah? And so phase two clinical trials, um, the, the numbers vary, but oftentimes they're around 80 people. They may be 150 at the, or 160 at the upper end, but that's usually the number. And then you have phase three clinical trials where say, well, you follow a show that in general it works, but there are subgroups in any population. Yeah, certain people react to certain treatments, others do not. And then you're looking at uh, two to 300 usually, sometimes maybe even more than that. Yeah, 
and that's usually phase three clinical trials. So that's the numbers you're looking at. But the general conclusion is, if you don't have at least 20 people per group, I, would, I wouldn't trust the data. And most of the time I wouldn't even touch the data, but certainly I wouldn't trust it because you're looking at huge effect sizes for something to come up that's statistically significant. I'm not so sure it will hold up when you, um, not, when you basically have a follow-up trial. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, thank you for the presentation and then for clarifying my answers. And thank you. Thank you. I know there's another question in the chat, but I do see Professor L. George has been raising the hand. So L, please go ahead. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank you very much for a very, very clear presentation. And, and I'm speaking as someone who's not familiar with the area, but I, but I do know, and, and I believe, I think I learned some things about it, about the area, but I also know somebody who has an autistic child. And what I know, I don't know a lot, but that person, that, that child, when, she, when he was younger, at least i don't know what's going on right now had cravings for particular foods and the food food nutrition and has something to do with you know it could relate to this oxidative stress or methionine or whatever um and i was wondering if your research opens up you know that combination of what what the child craves and wants to eat uh, with, with with these with these pathways you've identified as being the important ones and i was wondering is there any possibilities there uh, there are possibilities, but um, I mean, the, the connect, we have to be careful about the connections, okay? So one thing I wanna say here, and what I've not talked about is we have been involved in a lot of microbiome studies related to autism, okay? Because what you find like GI problems are very, very common, yeah, in children with autism, but they usually cannot be traced back to all the standard things we're monitoring. Yeah, I mean, they, they find that there are some slight markers for inflammation and so on, but when it comes to uh, all the standard things you look at for somebody who has GI problems, you can't predict, you don't know why. I mean, sure, there's, they may have constipation or diarrhea, but you can't tie it to a certain medical condition that usually is associated with it. And so the idea that the, GI, that the microbiome plays an important role there is clearly there. Yeah, in fact, we have several papers, but the difference between, that's the reason I haven't talked about them, we're not the lead on this. Yeah, we're working with other groups and we do a lot of analysis, but uh, but uh, we're not really not the leaders in that field. And to show that there are big differences in microbiome, in fact, there are some very um, promising trials that have been conducted on changing the microbiome that actually resulted in people feeling better. Yeah. What's less uh, less known is are they feeling better because their GI problems are better? And, I mean, I would anybody would feel better with that, right? Or is it also that certain other things also get better? That's unknown. Um, you are right in that there is a difference in what people eat. The dietary patterns are there, and there are some have been some studies on that saying, well, maybe it's not the microbiome. Maybe it's people eat different things, and then the microbiome is different because they do eat different things. And uh, I'm not saying that that's completely off the mark, but uh, the problem there is it's not so clear what's the cause and the effect. Yeah, because your microbiome also makes you crave certain foods and not crave others. And so it's not clear if it's the microbiome that contributes to the eating patterns or if it's the eating patterns that contribute to the microbiome. Yeah, um, clearly you do see differences in metabolite levels due to what the microbiome yeah, there's many important um, precursors for, uh, for neurotransmitters that are produced by your microbiome. Like one example, serotonin, because I know the number offhand, it's 90 to 95% of the serotonin that you use, and that's your brain makes heavy use of that, comes from the microbiome. It does not come from the rest of your body. Yeah, and so there's many others that we don't understand as well, but so clearly as a connection. Why am I very careful about this? It's not so clear how these two particular pathways that I looked at are affected by the microbiome. That really would require studies that are particularly tailored to that. And that's certainly something we're interested in. But you know, as costly as these trials are to conduct, it all depends on can I find a sponsor for this and that, or do they get more excited about slightly other things? But it's certainly the connection between the microbiome the metabolite levels in the blood, and ultimately also how your brain functions 
there is no doubt that there is a clear this uh, brain gut connection. I hope that answers the question. All right, so. So Jorgen, there's, uh, I think, a couple more questions. Rebecca, would you like to unmute and ask directly, or do you want me to read it out for you? I, I can read it out. Now, those are some, uh, yeah, some great questions. Uh, let me, but let me answer both of them individually. Yeah, the first one is, uh, it says, hello, I'm an autistic PhD student, so this is a very interesting to me. I'm wondering if your diagnostic predictions are robust across gender. Typical diagnosis tools are much worse at diagnosing girls, women. Uh, great comment and great observation, okay? Um, there has been a number of, uh, let's start with what is the current practice. Uh, one of the problems we have with the uh, current tools that we're dealing with is that um, the way, and especially young girls um, with autism, how they present, yeah, is a little different from how boys with autism present, okay? And, um, and there has been the concern that these tools were more, are more predictive for the boys and we miss out on a lot of the girls uh, at that age. Yeah, and uh, there's certainly some truth to that. If you want my opinion on that, is that right now we have this boy to girl ratio that's four to one. I do think that the, that the ratio is a little less than that. I do not think that the ratio is one to one. We're not missing that many. Yeah, there are some other factors which for some reason, uh, girls seem to be more resistant to uh, ASD than boys. But if you uh, like, I mean, I don't want to be quoted on this, okay? Because I'm just guessing, but you're, you're still gonna end up with a factor of maybe two or three to one or something like this. It's not gonna be one to one, but it's probably gonna be less than the four to one that we're seeing right now. Um, and there has been quite a bit of, no, quite a bit of an effort to uh, try to get the, to get a better understand what's going on there. But you are absolutely right in that our tools that we're currently using are not perfect. Now, did I find a difference in, uh, in our study with regard to metabolites? Yeah, um, we did not, I mean, let's say we did not find a difference with regard to the accuracy for boys versus girls. The accuracy was the same. Um, keep in mind one, what we're training, we're training upon what we think is the ground truth. Yeah, could it be that we're missing somebody on the girl side who has an ASD diagnosis and we have them as typically developing because then that's certainly a problem that could uh, creep into our work. And um, I, think we, I think we did reasonably well in that because many of our kids were a little older. Yeah? And so the diagnosis kids that children get older gets better. Yeah, when they do the 18 to 24 months, the diagnosis is not nearly as good as if you're looking at a six, seven, or eight year old. Yeah. The second thing is also all these trials. They had people. They had people uh, reevaluated as well by a team of, of specialists who really does nothing else but evaluate people. So that also helped there. Yeah. Um, but uh, to take a step back here, you do find there are meta differences in metabolite levels between boys and girls. There are also quite a bit of uh, differences in metabolite levels in general, based upon age as children age. For our two particular pathways that we, that we looked at, we did not find statistically significant differences for either yeah, um, boys, girls, or for age. Yeah? But that doesn't mean that in general, there are differences in some metabolites, but just not for the ones we looked at. So hopefully that, uh, that answers the first question. Uh, second question is a great question. This goes into bioethics. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically, I mean, uh, the thing is that uh, I think a, a big concern with all of this that you have is that, um, so let, let's assume you can, which luckily we weren't able to, but let's assume you can predict during pregnancy if a kid has ASD or not. Yeah, I really do not want to be in the position where somebody takes this information and then decides uh, to either terminate a pregnancy or not based upon that. I mean, that's a really, really difficult situation. Um, what we found here is that basically, look, it's not predictable. You can't tell this. And so that problem by itself went away with that. But it is something that we keep in mind when we do any, before we start any trial saying, look, what can be potential outcomes? In fact, some of our clinical trials, we have a bioethicist on board 
before we start a trial and saying, look, what are, what are the bigger pictures here? What are the things we have to be careful for? Because uh, none of the work we want, I mean, we don't want to make anybody's lives worse. We certainly don't want to make anybody feel bad about themselves. Yeah. All, and all of these things need to be discussed. And we as engineers aren't always the best ones to think about that side of things. Yeah. And so assembling a reasonably diverse team of people that discusses, including some bioethicists, is important for some of these trials. And we are, people are on board there yeah, because, uh, I mean, in the end, you're right, it is a slippery slope and you have to be very careful. You can't just always say like, well, I'm just a data scientist and I did X, Y, Z and what make people make it or is their problem. I do think that has to be discussed beforehand. And we try to do that to the degree possible. Yeah. Um, last comment along those lines, I mean, um, when the clinical trials, you need to get some external funding and most of those uh, funding agencies, they also usually have some people who have an autism diagnosis on the board to also get their say in that if they think that this is, uh, this is problematic or important. Uh, so there are, there are certainly some safeguards. I'm not claiming everything's perfect, but, uh, but it is part of the consideration. I, I hope I adequately addressed the question. Um, I think we get us. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think we are getting close to the, the time limit, but I do want to quickly comment here. This is a very timely presentation for me as well, because I'm teaching a graduate level machine learning data science course this semester. And actually two days ago, we just talked about support vector machine. So and I was just curious, did you ever try to use that other methods in addition to FDA, you know, you know official discriminatory analysis to run this classification task? Because now now there's a group of people Whenever you think about classification, I say, oh, let's do the convolution in the net. <laughs> All these, like, you know, nuclear weapon in certain way, I'm gonna call it. Um, and I do understand, you know, the difference between these two, right? Because the efficiency, of a complexity of model, computational, you know, efficiency and so on. But SVM was something that has been considered was quite robust and efficient. Have you ever tried it or you just of like- Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, me coming from the data side of things, I think we've used pretty much every algorithm in the book. Uh, we've looked at support vector machines. We have looked at uh, the deep neural nets. Yeah, we have looked at um, partially squares discriminant analysis. We've looked at um, random forest and I'm forgetting one. Oh, logistics regression too. Okay, yep. and uh, so basically, and then we have looked at some of the nonlinear extensions of these algorithms too, yeah. Uh, what, what I found is that, so the support vector machine works pretty much the same as uh, Fisher discriminant for this data set, yeah. Mm -hmm. The differences were like plus minus one, yeah. It wasn't any, um, uh, going to nonlinear methods, I did not find that that worked any better, um, especially when you, I mean, sure, you can get better fitting, but when it comes to like evaluation using either leave on out cross validation or some type of Monte Carlo approach, um, that, I mean, you're stuck at somewhere 95, 96, maybe 97 percent, no matter what method you use for this particular data set. Uh, interestingly, in this set, and I've even worked with uh, some of my colleagues who are machine, uh, not who are AI experts, and some deep neural nets, there isn't enough data there for that, that they, they work about the same. Okay, and uh, so the deep neural nets really come, become super powerful when you're dealing with thousands of data points. I mean, like this self-driving car where you have images coming in all the time, right? Or you're trying to analyze something in an image. They have orders of magnitude more input data, yeah? Uh, whereas the problem that we run into with these clinical trials, the number of participants is a cost factor. They're limited, yeah? The number of measurements per participant can be very, very high, but then that also, always increases the risk that you may overfit because well, for every measurement I use for a participant, I end up with another coefficient to get, right? And so it's a, we found that that's kind of the limit what you get for this data set. I'm not saying other applications may not find some. By the way, this is as a, call it a parting thought from my side. I mean, my focus is on autism. That's where my data comes from. That's the community I work with. But you would find out if you're looking at depression, yeah, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, you all find the same problems. The diagnosis is mainly the observations, but there are things happening in the body that result in these observations that you're seeing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so the idea of looking at 
what's happening in the body right now, and metabolomics is a good tool for that, and it's a relatively cheap tool to mm -hmm. predict this. I think there's tremendous potential, not mm -hmm. just with ASD, but with many, many other conditions, which are, as of now, really defined mainly by psychiatry. Yeah, and uh, but the psychiatry cannot tell you directly yeah, how to design a drug compound to help anybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. assuming that even exists, okay? I mean, if, if things are, have developed or degraded to a certain point, then that, that, that may, may be the wrong question to ask either. Yeah, but, uh, but this is, uh, I do think there's tremendous potential for many, many conditions that people have far beyond ASD and to figure out, let's get some more data science aspect in there because that is something that's really lacking. That's, I mean, it's only been the last five, 10 years where people started to look at that. Okay. Well, I guess we are kind of like, you know, reached the time limit and we start to lose the audience. So maybe it's a good time to conclude now. So thank you very much again, Professor Jogenheim for a wonderful presentation. Um, I wish you could visit us soon in person <laughs> to see our beautiful campus. And we definitely want to invite you back. And uh, I don't think Daniel is on the Zoom right now, but I think I'm sure he's going to mail you a, Sis and Jen give back. If I hear in person, I'll give it to you that way. But, you know, with the virtual way, we do have this mailing service. They work out well. And hopefully it won't be delayed too much because of upcoming storm. Thank you so much again. Enjoy the rest of the week and take care. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you. It's been a yeah. pleasure. Bye-bye.